All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming, for showing up. Um, thanks for the organizer for inviting me uh, to give this talk today. Uh, this is my first time in India and first time speaking in this uh, country, so I thought I would dress up nicely. Um, thanks, Dan, for the hat. Thanks for borrowing it. Um, my talk topic today is Appium for Couch Potatoes, and I really like to give this talk because um, working on this topic and on this, um, what, I would do, what, what I did there, really helped me to understand how automation works and help me to become a better automation engineer. And this talk is kind of a unicorn talk because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't give you best practices in mobile. It doesn't give you, you know, the tips and tricks for ADB. Uh, it's more like a, an introduction in how we test and automate uh, browsers and devices today and how I leverage existing protocols and interfaces uh, to, you know, automate a new device, and, uh, a smart TV that hasn't happened before. So, short introduction to me. Uh, my name is Christian. I'm working as a software engineer at Sauce Labs. Um, I'm uh, maintaining the Web.io uh, project, if you have heard about that. Um, and you can do a lot of open source and standard stuff on the internet. So, when I was starting working, like when I wrote my first Zelenium or Web.io script, I was kind of like really fascinating, fascinated because it felt somehow magic that, you know, you have your test script that says click on this element and somewhere on the other side of the world there's a browser in a random VM that does actually the click in there. It felt kind of magic and as a maintainer of a test framework, um, I see a lot of people, you know, complaining about something not working in that test process and they always blame the tool that they use which is WebDriver in that sense or it might be Selenium. And often in that, case, in that uh, case, often it's not really fair to always blame the framework because there are so many steps in between that can go wrong. You know, just looking at those three pillars that we have here that pretty much drive the automation of your test, there are these client libraries like WebDriver or Selenium or other tools. We have drivers that actually take care on doing the automation and we have those antivices. And it doesn't stop even there. We have also your test, your test can go wrong in some ways. Like it can't be wrong programmed in any way. Um, and then you have also, um, um, you know, your device, you know, the browser where it runs in, it should also, and your app that also has to work. So pretty much if you run a test and it passes, it pretty much tests, kind of tests all the pillars in between. It tests that your framework that you're using is actually working and doing the things that you expect. It tests that the driver is actually translating those commands into the, um, into the end device. And it also, you know, tests that the browser is actually clicking on the element and does the things that the click's supposed to do. So, you know, it's always important to think about where the error comes from, where it originates, and then try to find a solution for that, for that area. So let's do a simple example. Let's say we want to automate Chrome browser and we use, you know, we pick a random test framework. I just picked a random one, it's WebDriver. And to automate a Chrome browser, we, what we need to do is we need to download a driver. In this sense, in this case, it's, it's Chrome driver. So Chrome driver is then responsible to actually automate at the end the Chrome browser. So there are different ways of communication in there. It's not just, you know, one request to the browser to automate something and then it comes back with a response. So the first step of the way is a web driver protocol that tries to tell Chrome, the Chrome driver, what he has to automate. And then Chrome driver knows all about Chrome in order to actually automate the browser itself. And to kind of like reiterate why we have this setup as it is right now, we need to kind of like go back in history a little bit and understand how Selenium was created and how web driver was created to kind of understand why those things are uh, as they are right now. Let's go a little bit back. Let's go back to 2006 um, when this guy, Jason Huggins, you probably have seen him already a couple of times here at the conference, gave a talk uh, at um, um, the Google testing conference um, and he showed a tool that he called Selenium. And the problem that he try was trying to solve is he was working at ThoughtWorks and he had an expense tool. And you know, back in the days, it was 2006, uh, back in the days people were using Internet Explorer and you know, the first new browser came around that was Firefox and people started to uh, adapt the new browser. And then you know, the thing happened where things were working in Firefox but not in IE. Then he was fixing things in IE which would break things in, fi uh, in Firefox. 
And he really needed a tool that allowed him to test his application on both of those browsers. So he built something he called Selenium. And Selenium was pretty much a proxy server that would take commands based, uh, or based uh, on the HTTP protocol and the, the, the tool itself would render the page application under test in an iframe and it would trigger all those commands uh, using pure JavaScript, you know? Um, and it, has some limit, it had some limitation, uh, it had some problems, but it was a really great first approach to automate things in a browser. People were actually really excited about this. If you scroll down in the video, you see the first command saying something like, wow, this is too, uh, um, this is, um, you know, this is boring and boring uh, me to tears. Uh, no disrespect, but I'm gonna look for a different job. So, you, you know, regarding that tool, like people were really interested in the, the whole uh, tool and the whole possibilities that such automation tool can provide us. A year later then, uh, another guy came around, who, uh, which name was Simon Stewart. We all know him. He built the um, uh, Salem, He helps building the Salem project as well, and he had he he showed a tool that was called WebDriver. WebDriver was took an interesting, different approach. It used it used the native capabilities of the operation system and the native interfaces of the browser in order to do the automation. For Firefox, he used to you know. Created, he created a telnet connection to the browser in order to trigger clicks and automation on the, on the browser. For IE, I think he used the com interface of Microsoft uh, to do the same. The, the different to Selenium, this was only working for Java. So he had a Java implementation that was working great, but you couldn't use it in any, any different language. To summarize that, um, again, we had Selenium that uses some sort of proxy server uh, to take any kind of HTTP request to automate things in a browser, um, and it would it would do that by just using pure JavaScript, uh, versus WebDriver that used some native capabilities like the COM interface or Telnet in order to do the automation in the browser. So every approach had its advantages and disadvantages, but overall, um, you know, it was two really well approaches to automate things. You know, fast forward to today, we know that. Selenium and WebDriver have been merged into one project that we call Selenium WebDriver today. It's um, by far the most popular automation uh, framework uh, that exists and kind of like the automation standard um, for you know, testing from end to end. But also something different, really interesting happened. Uh, as you can see here, we created, or the people around the project created a de facto standard on top of automation. And we call that today WebDriver. It's a, W3C standard like CSS, um, like all the other you know, browser APIs that you know. Um, and that means it's really interesting, like I really love that WebDriver is a W3C standard because it encourages every browser render to sit with us in one room and you know, try to um, evolve the standard in a way that it fits every, our requirements of today. And it's not only one person that develops the standard, it's uh, a lot of people that are interested in the technology and in the use cases that this technology brings it. I'm not sure who, have, who of you have ever looked into the standard itself, into the specification, but if you do, you will find a bunch of comma, a bunch of endpoints that are defined there and what those endpoints are supposed to do. Um, it's pretty much, if you compare it, it's pretty much like a REST API, like a REST server. Um, so it takes HTTP requests, like the slash session would give you a browser and would, would return a session ID. And with that session ID, then you can call all these different commands that, do you, that allow you to do all the various things in the browser. Uh, one important note here is that the protocol was designed to mimic a user. So everything that the user is supposed to do, you should be supposed to do in the browser, which is, you know, which is uh, sufficient for most of our test cases that we have so far. Second. That happens sometimes. Go away. <laughs> Stop it. All right. So the usual test setup looks usually like this. You have a test script uh, on the top left using a client framework like Selenium or WebDRL. Uh, and those tools would just, you know, their, their task is to just send HTTP requests to 
a driver or a server that has this REST API implemented. So we have on the one side all the browser drivers that help us to automate browsers, and we have on the other side um, uh, mobile devices where we use Appium um, that wraps all the native um, mobile automation frameworks into an REST API so that we can use the same tools for mobile as well as for uh, browser testing. And as I mentioned before, uh, WebDriver is designed to um, automate from the vision of the user, from the perspective of the user. Fast forward to today, and you know, we were, we were working on this back for a couple of years, and fast forward to today, this is kind of not, um, not sufficient anymore for, for some user types. Like, you know, for QA testers that want to spin up a browser, that is still fine, but you know, we want also as a developer want to start automating the browser. We want to do the similar thing that we can do with Android and ADB, you know, using some sensors in the device to you know, do some more magic on the phone to test our application. We want to also don't want to do that in the browser. So I thought, well, you know, I could not only use the web driver um, interface to automate the browser, I could also just directly connect to the native Chrome, to the native browser interface to do more than just um, the normal browser automation. So I built a plugin for WebDriver.io that is called the DevTool service, and the DevTool service is directly connected with the parallel connection uh, to the browser in order to access all the native Chrome and browser interfaces uh, that exist in the browser today, which are pretty much everything that you can do in the DevTools, you can do on, with that interface. So as a demo, I prepared a little um, performance test that I want to show using uh, WebDriver.io. Um, so let me zoom in in here. So as you, if, if you guys have already used WebDriver.io, you know that you have something called a config file that allows you to define all your testing capabilities in a config file where your specs are located, how many instances you want to run in parallel, all that stuff. What's important here is that I've defined my little demo app, which is Tony's favorite food. It's a small React app uh, that just I use for demo purposes. So this is my base URL. Uh, I want to run my test in Chrome. And I have those plugins defined in my service list. Um, one is DevTools, so I can access all the interfaces. And the other is Chrome driver. So I have two tests in here. And if you, have, if you use the DevTools service in WebDriver.io, it will add a couple of commands to the browser uh, variable um, that it, you can use. One of, it, one of which is the enable performance audits command. It allows you to set some throttling capabilities um, to enable or to emulate a mobile device because it will help you to identify performance bottlenecks uh, much quicker than, um, than when you don't throttle. And then I would op open the URL and the DevTool service would take care on tracing the browser and looking into the network activities to then provide me a bunch of performance metrics. In this case, uh, get metrics and get performance metrics, uh, performance score. The one gives me normal performance metrics like first meaningful pain, time to first interactive, and the other one gives me the light pe lighthouse performance score that you might know from the uh, dev tools in the browser. And the other test uh, is doing the same. It does not throttle because it just checks how many kilobytes have been transferred in the browser. And in this case, I'm interested in how many images I download, I, my app downloads, and uh, how big my scripts are. So let's start um, run my first test. Um, the application is pristine, so I haven't, it should pass in the first test. So I run it, and two browsers spawn up, spin up. So while the page is loading, the browser, like the DevTool service traces the page load to get all the information that it needs to calculate all these performance metrics. Second test for the performance one. And hopefully the test will pass. Come on. There we go. Two passing tests. Um, I now use it. So the app is uh, implemented in, um, in using a tool called Glitch, which allows me to modify it online and immediately uh, we deploy it. So I wanted to do what I'd want to do now is implement some performance problems. So my webpack, I say, my webpack mode is development. That means it doesn't do any tree shaking or anything like that. 
Um, then in my server, I disable the compression for scripts. And something that I really like to do is I want to mine Bitcoin because the crypto mar market is really hot these days. So why not just mine Bitcoin? So I wait until the page is uh, deployed. And then I'm gonna run my test again. Uh, take some time. Let's see if it's already up. And you can see the page already slowing, uh, is loading slower because the mine Bitcoin function pretty much blocks the main thread for uh, one and a half seconds. So let's run the test again. Again, we do the, uh, the performance test for the resources. So this time it checks um, how many script I have downloaded and how, many, how big the images were. Um, and the next test is doing the same for performance. You see it already failing. Uh, maybe we can go in there. And you see, I was expecting that the images have around 450 mega, uh, kilobyte, oh no, my page load. Uh, my pay overall page rate should be about 450 kilobyte, but no, with the, un, um, with the uncompressed script, it's almost 1.5 megabyte. And then the same for performance, should come in in a second. Those tests take a little bit longer because they wait until the CPU is idle um, and all the things. So, okay, the performance test is failing due to timeout um, because the page took so, uh, too, far, uh, too long to load. Uh, but you can see here that um, the page rate overall has, uh, or my scripts overall, uh, were much, much bigger than my test expected to be. So this just should just show you the capabilities that we have if we use the native interfaces of the browser. Um, as I mentioned before, this is using the Chrome DevTools protocol, which is the native interface for Chrome. Um, and uh, Chrome is doing all this automation. If you have heard about Puppeteer, Puppeteer is the client that uh, instead of using WebDriver, it uses the Chrome DevTools interface. That was my demo. Okay, now come to the second half of the talk, um, which is about HPE TV, which is the thing that I wanted to automate, and yeah, wanted to automate. Um, and HPE TV, if you haven't heard about it, it's uh, also a standard that defines how we can build application using web technologies on all modern TVs today. It is similar to WebDriver uh, is standard, but it is um, defined in a different standards institute. In this case, it's a European tele uh, telecommunication standard institute. Um, that means that there are also a bunch of people that are interested in their technologies. They sit together with the vendors of the uh, televisions uh, to create a standard that, you, that will allow you to build web applications across all uh, modern uh, TV devices. Because you know we moved to an IoT era. Uh, everything will be connected within the next couple of years. Uh, that is not only TVs. That is also you know your fridge and whatnot. The way how we started to make devices connected is is with utility devices like, for instance, setup boxes in this context of TV. Uh, so if you wanted to connect an old TV with a uh, with the internet, we used something like Apple TV. We had game consoles that would allow us to give those some sort of browsing context in the TV, and the same for smart TV sticks. So the reason why HTV, HPV TV exists is, think about you would have to build an application that is supposed to work of all of these environments. You would probably have to build an application that is written in six different languages uh, for five different vendors, um, and it will, would really be impossible to maintain that kind of application. So that's why there, the HPV standard exists, and it is supported across a variety of, open, uh, of operation systems that are shipped with smart TVs today. Uh, there's WebOS, there's Tyson, that's probably, probably more popular from Samsung, there's Android TV, there's Roku TV, and Firefox OS. All those operation systems are shipped in those modern smart TVs that you can buy today, and the HPV TV, HPV TV standard allows you to build applications using web technologies on those TVs. This is a sample, simple uh, example of an HPV TV app. Uh, this is using the 1.5 version of the standard, which was defined, I think, six years ago. And back then, people were still using XHTML. So this is all XHTML. The new version allows you to write on modern HTML5 uh, capabilities. 
Something that's important to point out here is that you have a content type that is application slash VND HPV TV. Uh, that's important so the TV understands that it's a proper HPV TV app. Then you have an onload script where you initiate your application. And something important, it's called this object type, this object tag, which is an OIPF application manager that gives you the abilities to access TV interfaces using JavaScript. And this is where HPV TV defines the most of the rules because uh, you know every TV vendor has to be spec compliant. That means it needs to provide the same interfaces uh, to manage the TV uh, in all cases. And this is your init application function that would you know get this object tag um, and would create you know this uh, get owner application in order to access the HPV TV capabilities. Then you can be like app show. You can register to remote events on your remote device, right? You can, you can uh, control the volume of the TV and all sorts of things. As I mentioned, it is currently widely rolled out in Europe. Um, it is considered in other states, uh, in other countries of the world. Um, depending on how popular this you know, um, technology becomes, it might be you know, supported at some point uh, all over the world. And there are two kinds of uh, HPV TV application. There's one there which is broadcast independent and one that is broadcast related. So the independent applications are usually being downloaded via some sort of app store. Uh, you probably know this from Apple TV. You can go to the uh, iOS app store or Apple app store and download uh, application specific for an Apple TV. The same would it be for uh, those broadcast independent application. Uh, the more common ones are usually broadcast related. That means that you open a broadcast channel and it would show you that an HPV TV application is available so you can access it directly. And the way how it works is the following. You have your, broad TV, your broadcaster in the top and you know, every TV receives the broadcast signal using the DVP um, standard that comes over cable, over satellite, or over terrestrial. Um, and with the HPV, HPV TV standard, this broadcaster would also send you an IET package. It's an application information table. That application information table usually contains information about the channel that they're used, currently watching. It contains information about what kind of show is currently uh, be shown, like what's the next show, what was the previous show. Um, and with this standard, it also contains a an URL that defines where the HPV TV application is defined because it's a normal web application that is hosted by a static server. So once the television receives the broadcast signal and the IET package, it passes to the IET to the table, finds the HPV TV URL, and does a second request to a web server of the broadcaster to download the application. So here's an example of how it would work uh, for a German television uh, channel. Um, once the broadcast signal is received, you see the application is provided and you need to press the red button on your remote device and you can you know, switch around the menu. And uh, what's really interesting is that you can switch between a broadcast, um, broadcast stream to an on-demand video. Um, so that allows you to provide capabilities as Netflix has or any you know, other cloud stream provider. Another example for the second German television, it's Actually the same, I found out while working on um, the driver, that it's actually the same channel that has the same code, it just has a different style, different styling and different content. But this is just one approach of using HPV TV technology. Um, this is a different example, how you can use it in the context of uh, uh, commerce, uh, commercial um, products. So this HPV TV application can connect to an application in your, on your phone or in your tablet. And it would show you all the items that you provide as a, you know, um, e-commerce shop uh, that are currently shown in the frame on the TV, which is pretty cool. I mean, you can, you know, see, okay, this guy, this actor wears those sneakers. Where can I find those sneakers? And with those kind of technologies, you can, you know, uh, sell those kind of products directly to the customers. There are other ex uh, interesting examples where uh, an HPV TV app would allow you to um, translate the broadcast stream in your language that you understand. So you could pretty much watch your favorite movies if you travel around the world in your native language. 
So as a developer, um, as an HPV TV developer, you really have a hard time because you will end up in rooms like this. I have taken this picture um, where you have, you find yourself among thousands of TVs and even millions of remote devices because, you know, someone loses the battery for this remote device and you have to get another one and so on and so forth. And the problem is with um, HPV TV is similar like to mobile. The fragmentation of devices is just huge. You have all these different kind of TV models. I've shown you five operation system uh, and there are different kind of TV models that have those operation system installed. So if you build an HPV TV app, you have to make sure that your application works on all these devices. And you know, some devices are older that support an older st uh, standard of the HPV TV um, you know, that only have JavaScript supported until ECMAScript 3, which is what uh, IE6 would use, uh, have been using. And there are other devices that use more the modern version of the standard that have, uh, that have HTML5 and the latest JavaScript um, capabilities. So as a QA dev, QA engineer, you would pretty much look like this guy uh, sitting on the couch and have to click through all these applications to check if that app is actually working on all those TVs. Um, and you know, you don't want to look like this. So what the, this research institute found over focus, they invited me to work on this specific problem as part of my master's thesis during college. And I was back then, I was already working for SaaS, uh, and I kind of like knew how WebDriver and how Selenium works. Um, so I was thinking, how can I solve this problem without reinventing the wheel? Uh, you know, there are great automation technologies that have been, you know, become an industry standard, which is Selenium and WebDriver, and there are other tools that I can use that provide me developing context and developing tooling for free. So I started building a tool called DevTools Backend. And the DevTools Backend is supposed to be a mix between Selenium and WebDriver as it started. Uh, Selenium, the DevTools Backend is a proxy server that allowed me to inject JavaScript into those HPV TV application to run automation uh, using pure JavaScript. So it's pretty much the Selenium approach that Jason bought with the Selenium project. But also I wanted to use native capabilities that already exist today. So I decided to uh, build all this on top of the Chrome DevTools protocol. So I was able to leverage the current existing Chrome DevTools tools um, to allow debug application. Here's an example. Um, I set up a, the DevTools backend as a proxy for my Firefox browser on the right and was then able to connect with a DevTools uh, application to debug uh, in my favorite DevTools application, uh, a Firefox browser. The way how it works, um, you probably can't see it, but I will explain it. The, how, the way how it works is that you would inject the script and then the script would connect um, itself to a server that I have outside, the DevTools backend. And um, it would then allow you to communicate with the web application that you want to test um, using DevTools um, messages. So let's, for instance, let's say we want to get the source of the HPV TV app. What we would do is we would enable the DOM, um, the DOM domain in the DevTools protocol. Okay, the server will then say, okay, I enabled it for you. You can now send me DOM commands. So the next method would be uh, dom.getDocument, um, which is the method in the DevTools protocol. And then the, the front end script in the application would return all the information about the DOM elements using the proper format that is defined in the DevTools specification. So apply this to a TV. Um, I was able for the first time, I think, ever to actually debug broadcast H HPV TV applications that are not built by myself uh, at home um, using uh, the DevTools backend. And that was really exciting because uh, I was able to see into the source that usually no one was able to get into. Um, so I implemented everything that I needed to have in order to use the elements panel of your DevTools application. Um, the, with some monkey patching, I was able to get all the console messages, which are actually pretty funny because uh, HPV developer know that no one will access or no one will be able to see those kind of messages. So they had some funny messages in there 
um, that I forgot to screenshot, but it, um, was there were a lot of weird messages in there that I didn't understand at all. Um, and since the DevTools backend is a proxy server, it allows me to listen to all the events that were passed into the TV um, to create all the information that I need to show every request in the network panel. So that's really helped me just by using the DevTools protocol to provide those kind of debugging tooling uh, around my automation tool. So this is where Appium comes into place, right? I wanted to leverage the great idea that Jason had uh, by providing an HTTP protocol in order to allow me to send commands to my web application under test um, to automate it. So Appium is great for that because it allows me to build a driver for just everything that exists today. I mean, we have seen uh, Jonathan build a driver for um, and Raspberry Pi um, and all that. You can use Appium for everything. So it's pretty much the star driver uh, among all the drivers. Um, so what this HPV TV, HPV TV driver would do, it, it would use the, back, back, uh, the DevTools backend um, to get access to the application under test using the DevTools protocol, um, but would provide you those access using the web driver specification. Um, so you, the way how it works is would be as a tester, if you want to spin up a session, the um, HPV TV driver would then inject the script into the TV and would allow you to send methods over the HPV uh, web driver protocol. But once it receives the command, it would translate the web driver uh, command into the DevTools, uh, the Chrome DevTools command. Um, exactly. So the way how I proxied it is, I gave every TV a Raspberry Pi, and so that the TV was connected to the Raspberry Pi, and the Raspberry Pi was connected to the internet. So every internet, every uh, request went through the Raspberry Pi and was proxied through the DevTools backend. Um, so also on those Raspberry Pis, the driver, the Appium driver was running. Um, that allowed me to just simply connect those drivers automatically to a grid that exists on a specific uh, domain. Um, I built a simple web application that would just grab the information of the TV user using the user agent um, and then automatically would uh, register itself to a grid uh, in my you know, network uh, so, I'm, so that I was able to automate uh, in parallel, not only on one device, but also in parallel on multiple devices. And that looked like this. I was running a web driver O script in Jenkins and was automating this HPU TV app. Uh, where I would go to a specific page, and in this example, I wanted to test if the video on this page is actually playing or not. And as you can see, the TVs are, you know, have a different speed because every TV has a different amount of CPU available to show those. And you know, if the TV is more modern, uh, it usually allows you to do much more and much more quicker things. If the TV is old, sometimes the application just crashes. Luckily, since I'm using existing protocols and tooling, uh, the script that I needed to run the test with uh, are pretty simple and almost the same as a browser testing script. Uh, so here, I have everything nicely encapsulated into a page object. Um, I'm using WebDriver.io here as well. The only difference that you might see here is um, with the navigation. Um, so on a computer, on a mobile phone, you know, you have more input um, more input devices, right? On the computer, you have like your mouse and you have your keyboard. Um, on a smart TV, you just have a remote device, right? Nothing else. So in order to navigate, you need to know where you are currently focused and then, you know, need to use the key commands in order to move around the application. So you see here in the open method, um, I open the HPV TV app where I know where I am and then I say press down, 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 down and then press enter in order to hit a specific page. And then the rest of it looks pretty much the same as a normal page object, uh, page object would look like. You define your elements and some helper utilities. For instance, uh, is video playing, where I just execute a JavaScript using the DevTools plugin, proxy to the web application on the test to see if the play state of the video is the expected one. Again, I'm using existing tools, so I can also use existing reporting. Um, so everyone was able to connect any random reporter, in this case Allure or a JUnit reporter, to print results automatically in my CI system. 
Here's a different example that I showed at SeleniumConf two years ago where I built my own HPV TV application. Um, you see the node that this application is available and then the script would just go through the app and would check that every page is being able, well, was open correctly. And you see on the bottom left that the Appium server is, is running all the commands. Some key to takeaways. Um, during this time, during, during my master thesis, I really learned how automation works, how browser technology works, and I was able to just connect all these existing t technologies in order to leverage the tooling around those technologies for free. Um, something that I also would really en you encourage you to do is to start um, contributing to existing frameworks, to existing protocols, to existing tooling that is out there because it also helps you to understand what happens or what, what, what is going on between sending an automation command uh, and the you know, browser receiving the automation command. With that being said, uh, thank you for your attention. Um, this one will talk, thank you. Hey, hi, Christian, my name is Sumit. So I just had one question. Uh, the Raspberry Pi that you used uh, in the demo, uh, we can skip it, right? That was just for the APM you had installed in there? No, it was for the DevTools backend because okay. it was a proxy server and it was installed on this Raspberry Pi in, all, in order to um, you know, inject the script into the web app. Okay. It was actually really lucky for me that all HPV TV application were served over HTTP because if it would be HTTPS, I would never be able to you know, look into the source code and all that. Okay, thank you. So I, I wanted to ask regarding uh, WebOS as well as uh, you uh, talked about uh, Firefox driver and uh, Roku and all those things. So do we have anything, uh, like, like you said, you re used Raspberry Pi. So we can use a Linux uh, instance as well for the same, right? So we can connect it directly to a Linux machine and uh, have a grid connected to all the TVs, right? Yeah, you need just some sort of yeah environment where you uh, right. where you route your network through, so right. that you can capture whenever an HPP TV application is loaded. Hey, inject this JavaScript so I can communicate with the application. Yeah, so uh, your implementation is for uh, web OS or a particular OS, or have you implemented the HPV uh, TV driver for all the kind of OS we have, like web OS and uh, uh, Tizen as well? So it was uh, built in a way that every, every smart TV that uses HPV TV standard uh, would be able to be automated. Okay. However, this approach can technically be uh, apply it to every web environment where you are able to access the network and implement the proxy and man in the middle to in order to inject the script. So every web environment uh, that you have, you can use this approach to be to automate it. Okay. So we have the drivers available. I mean, uh... yeah, the HP, the Appium HPV TV driver and the DevRoots backend are open source on my GitHub repository. Right. Um, I haven't worked on the project for the, the for like the last year. Uh, but they are still there, the code is there, so. Sure, I will try it out, thanks. So, uh, hi, and uh, my question was like, uh, the dev tool you showed us, so is it uh, working like a React Native debugger or like something we have to connect with the device, then only we will be able to inspect the element and uh, you, implement the you're talking about the DevTools backend? Yeah. Yeah, it is, just, um, it is just for web environments that you don't have immediately access to. Um, it just gives you, it's like an injected script that returns all the information off the page uh, using normal JavaScript APIs. Uh, so it, it wouldn't make sense to use it for a React Native application because I'm not sure if you can just run web like JavaScript as you would normally do. So I'm not sure about that. Okay. I don't think so. That's good. Do we have any more questions? All right. Thank you. Uh, I was being nice enough since uh, the beginning. Yeah. Thanks, Rishi. Thank you. Thanks.